So my name is Anthony Thornburg, and I play one of the main characters in the, the story. Um, what was it called again? The Golden... Land. Golden Land. I keep confusing it with Golden Hour, because a lot of the scenes that we were trying to time was with the golden hour of the day. Um, so yes, it was a very complicated project because it's a, it's a, a piece, a time piece. It's something that's set in the past. And with those kinds of things, in order to really avoid having things look too costumey um, and, and things that feel realistic, although it's a fantasy story, it's not based on a historical event or documentary or anything. But I had to pay very close attention to making sure that the materials, the, the shapes, the styles were, were correct. I mean, not, it doesn't have to be one-to-one, -one, but that it's, it would be believable in this story. That was, a, that was a huge challenge. It required a lot of research and a lot of time, a lot of references. But even down to certain details like uh, the props, some of the props that my character had, um, bow and arrow, you know, I wanted to make sure that these were made in a typical manner and uh, using the right materials that would have been correct at that time period or acceptable at that time period. So I had spent a lot of time researching also in the past. I had done this uh, already a few quite a few years ago, which was also one of the things that helped inspire me to want to play this character and to want to uh, take part in a story like this, was I came across the Encyclopedia of Native American Bows and Arrows. And it was so interesting and complex based on different regions and styles of hunting and based on what was naturally available in the areas, um, how these things were made. And I became obsessed with it. I started studying the techniques and the proper techniques, the types of wood. I wanted to make everything in the same exact manner. So, you know, no electric tools, all hand tools, all, you know, I got a funny story as well. The first time I made one, I spent about 40 hours, nearly 40 hours. And well, on the tilling process, that's when you, you know, the, the bow has to be bent and the, the string has to be putting a, an amount of tension and pressure on the wood. Uh, it broke during that first process, and I was I was so disappointed, and I had. But there is a vital experience within that, a vital mistake that I had made. One single small detail was incorrect, and that was enough to put these forty plus hours right into the garbage. And but I I learned what I had done incorrectly, and when you work with living materials. Um, you're, you're not really the boss. Like you, you really have to understand what that material wants to do, and then you have to work with it. So that was, I think, the favorite part of playing this character and this process. The character itself that I was playing is someone who is based on um, a mixed heritage and mixed history, which is also very close to something that I, I understand. Um, I was never raised specifically or strictly as like a singular culture or a singular heritage. So I, I took influences from all the things that were around me, uh, especially friends and people who came from different backgrounds. So that fascinated me and interested me so much to the point that I enjoyed playing a wide range of characters. Um, the, the biggest challenge was having to understand for myself that I must play this story in a way that also translates my own. Um, this character, he was supposed to be someone who has suffered from loss. Uh, he, he lost his family, he lost his, his existence and even himself. And he's trying to now adapt to what is the modern lifestyle, what is happening around him. And, and he realizes he will be left behind in the past. So he's trying to, to adapt. And through this meeting that he has with the main character in the story, he finds himself again. He finds a purpose again. And it's very, very similar to what happens in, in my own home and in my own family history. We, we lost everything. Um, we lost who we were and 
we were just expected to adapt. Um, we were expected to move on, make the best of things. And I had always trouble with that. I, I, I didn't want to reinvent myself. I wanted to find out who I was and who we were. In the past few years of my life, I've spent a lot of time with my family, especially with my father, researching and understanding those things. And my character in this, this, this film, this story, um, he's, he's experiencing that firsthand. That was the most challenging part, that I wanted to make sure that this character feels that and that the audience feels that from him. I don't know if I did a good enough job. I don't know if they will feel that or if they will see that, but that was the number one thing that I kept in mind um, throughout this storyline and throughout playing this character, having the responsibility and the role for that. There are different types of, of actors, there are different types of performers. Some are good at playing all types of roles and that they want to. And you'll often um, hear suggestions or um, critiques from others that will say, well, if you're not prepared to play any type of role, you shouldn't be an actor. I actually think that is very, very poor advice. I don't think anyone should listen to somebody who gives that type of critique or criticism. There's an importance to understand what are your capabilities, what are your strengths. It's also good to work on your weaknesses, like let's say comedy, for example, if you're someone who's not uh, very good in the category of comedy, it's probably helpful and important to spend some time working on those weaknesses, but not necessarily every actor should focus on being able to play every type of role. I think I myself lack the necessary requirements to play all types of roles. So I would say that for myself, personally, I, I end up in, in sort of more like an alleyway. And in that alleyway, that's what I'm best at or what I feel most confident and most comfortable with. Maybe as I get older, you, um, you'll see a lot of actors as they age, they start to do different stories. They start to do a lot of things tailored more towards children's stories, like uh, Eddie Murphy, for example. If you've seen all of his stand-up comedies and films when he was younger, they were just, in my opinion, some of the most hilarious things ever. And fast forward 15, 20 years from now, he's mostly doing movies for kids. And a lot of people say, well, it's, it's not the same person anymore. And I think, well, absolutely. A person evolves and changes their, their categories. And you shouldn't just stop yourself at one, one category. So... I would say focus, I will focus myself on the types of roles that I'm most passionate and interested in, which are things like science fiction, fantasy, and historical dramas, like the one that, that we're, we just did. Um, that is the direction that I plan to see myself more towards, and that I will focus on improving, because I'm still at the start, I'm still at the beginning. Uh, who knows, maybe one day I'll do comedy or romantic dramas or whatever it is in the future. Maybe I'll get a taste for those things, and I'll... I'll, I'll really like them, but for as for now, that's mostly where my focus will be. Yeah, plenty. Um, I would say <laughs> one of my favorites is uh, Toshiro Mifune. He played in a lot of Kurosawa's films um, early on. Uh, he did a lot of samurai epics, and I was a big fan uh, of how he acts, how he and developed himself. I was very impressed and, and surprised when he would have certain scenes in performance as well, especially when he would do his fighting scenes. Um, I, I would take a look at his techniques and, and think for myself, wow, that's, that's actually something that he trained very, very seriously. And he wanted this to, to appear very realistic. Um, another actor that I like a lot is uh, Ken Watanabe, another Japanese actor, a modern Japanese actor. Uh, I find his performances always to be attractive. Every time I see him on a screen, I'm paying very close attention to how he behaves and how he says. I'm very captivated by his performances. Um, other newer modern actors, I think um, they're Austin Butler is an interesting one. Um, I had watched this, uh, this Elvis story, and I remember thinking for myself, well, this is someone I'm not familiar with playing such an extraordinarily massive role. Big Elvis fan, everyone in Hawaii is. Um, 
So I thought for myself, well, there's a huge weight to carry on his shoulders, and is he, is he, going, to, is he going to carry it responsibly? Is he going to do it appropriately? And I had seen that a lot of people may, maybe felt like he, he didn't really look exactly like Elvis or, you know, but I saw in his mannerisms there was a certain characteristic and charm that he has naturally that Elvis Presley also had. And that was enough for me within the first 10 minutes of watching this film. I was totally sold. I was very convinced and I was very entertained. So I think that guy has a very bright future. Also as well, the last time I was at home, I was having a conversation at the dinner table with my family and my sister had said that the second chapter of Dune um, they're already working on. And uh, she said Austin Butler is going to be in the, the second chapter. And I remember immediately at that moment thinking for myself, is he going to be playing the character Fade Rautha? I asked my sister and she said, actually, yes, he is. And I was so happy and I thought, what a good casting. That was a very good person to cast as Fade Rautha because he is an extremely important character to the story. He is in a sense the savior for, for the broken and, and the, the downtrodden and the defeated, this Harkonnen world and planet. So I was very, very interested and excited to hear about that. And I look to those actors to, for my own inspirations and, and to, uh, to train myself. Favorite song from Elvis? Uh, he did an extraordinary performance. There were two really, really incredible ones. Um, there was Frank Sinatra's My Way that he performed, and this was at um, one of my favorite performances in my hometown. Uh, he did this at the Aloha Stadium. That was one of the best I've ever seen. But I would say his last official filmed performance was by their original song was the Righteous Brothers' Unchained Melody. You can see as Elvis is coming onto the stage that this was at a time in his life where he was really struggling. Um, he, he had a lot of um, dependencies at that time. He was very ill. He was taking a lot of medications, probably also had a lot of addictions. Um, and he could barely speak on a microphone uh, when, when he was being asked certain things. But when that man sat down and he started to perform and he started to sing, it was so extraordinary to understand that this man has everything in his music. He has all. Uh, it was two different people, completely different people. And he sang that song with all of his heart and it was beautiful. It was absolutely beautiful. And I thought, how can a person just turn something on like that? This, this passion, this talent. Um, I think that's why so many people loved him, not just because he was handsome and charismatic and good looking and could sing and could act and could do all these things. It was because he was to the depth of his roots, an extraordinary performer.